Today, I'm choosing violence because I'm gonna challenge the belief that you need ripping hot temperatures to cook a great steak and get a perfect sear. In my last video on whether basting works, I seem to have touched a nerve when I said, don't believe the kitchen bullshit that you need a ripping hot pan to cook a great steak. My goal for this video is to go deep into how searing really works and show you a few ways that you can get a great sear on your perfect steak for a great looking flavorful crust with minimal overcooking beneath it while avoiding greasy, smoky, and potentially fiery cooking drama. Unless you're into that kind of thing, in which case, stay tuned because we will definitely get into that too. But first, a word from our sponsor, which is me or at least my company, Combustion Inc. We've designed and built this wireless predictive thermometer that you'll see me using in the rest of this video. What makes it special? Well, a bunch of things. Like eight sensors that find the true core of your food and measure everything going on in and around your food from the surface to the center. So its physics engine can figure out how your food is cooking and predict exactly when it will be done the way you want. You can learn more at our website, combustion.inc or check out the product links below. Now, let's get back to our video and start with the appearance and flavor of a great crust, which is built on the foundation of tastes, aromas, and colors created by the Maillard reaction up to about 350 degrees Fahrenheit. You might also like a bit of charring on your crust, which happens when the surface temperature exceeds 350 degrees and you go beyond the Maillard reaction to pyrolysis and start turning meat into carbon. I think this is important to understand. You might be cooking in a ripping hot pan or grill, but when you sear, you want most of the crust to peak at temperatures at about 350 degrees Fahrenheit or so, so that you develop delicious Maillard flavors rather than turning the crust into bitter tasting char. Again, if you like char grilled flavor in your crust, you want a few spots on the crust to get hotter than 350 degrees. But I hope we can all agree that charring the entire surface isn't delicious. Which brings us to the next topic, water, which is what makes the perfect sear elusive. Because your steak is pretty much water with some shit mixed in it. Hear that sizzle? That's the sound of droplets of water from the steak flashing to steam. Where the meat meets metal, High heat rapidly evaporates water and concentrates the proteins, amino acids, and naturally occurring sugars in a desiccation zone, AKA the crust. If we get really close, we can get a better look at what's actually going on. As the surface of the steak dries out, its temperature quickly rises above the boiling point of water and the Maillard reaction accelerates. But just beneath the crust, the temperature is stalled at the boiling point of water. This is the boiling zone. Surprisingly, no matter how hot your pan, the speed that the steak will cook is limited by the boiling point of water just beneath the crust, because this is the temperature the rest of the steak feels. As the pan's temperature increases, water boils faster, but not hotter. As a result, the thickness of the crust and the boiling zone don't change much. Despite the differences in searing temperatures, by the time these steaks are cooked through, the difference in the amount of overcooking beneath the surface is minimal. Grilling over charcoal at even higher temperatures isn't different. The evenness from edge to edge is similar to the pan roasted steaks. It turns out the amount of overcooking beneath the crust is mostly a function of the time the steak spends searing, not how hot the sear is. And because boiling juices beneath the crust puts the same speed limit on all of these steaks, searing hotter doesn't cook any steak faster than another but it can burn the surface before the inside is cooked through. So how do the crusts look on these steaks? The steak cooking in the 325 degree pan starts out looking terrible, but over the full cooking time, its crust develops a uniform mahogany color that looks pretty good to me. But if you prefer to shade darker, just increase the pan's temperature to about 350 degrees. Meanwhile, the steak seared in the ripping hot pan quickly develops a better looking crust but over the full cooking time, that crust becomes overdone and too charred for my taste. And the surface temperatures over hot charcoal are simply too high. Within a few flips, I'd say that this crust is burned and the steak has been ruined. 
This steak really needed a two-zone grilling setup. The takeaway is, if you're gonna pan roast or char grill even a moderately thick steak, it's better to cook with a hot, but not ripping hot pan or grill. The steak cooks just as fast, there's not more or less overcooking beneath the surface, and you'll get a nice looking and flavorful crust. Plus, the lower searing temperature won't smoke up your kitchen or singe all the hair off your arm. Searing at a relatively low temperature and flipping frequently is probably the simplest method to cook a respectable steak. But you can do better by dividing and conquering. Since searing time and not temperature determines the amount of overcooking beneath the crust, why not reverse sear or cook the steak sous vide first? And is one of these techniques better than another for your perfect sear? To answer that, here are three steaks. One cooked from raw by flipping every 30 seconds in a 350 degree pan. One pre-cooked sous vide and then seared for one minute per side and one reverse seared and also seared for one minute per side at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. All of these steaks have been cooked to the same final medium rare core temperature of 129 degrees Fahrenheit. You can clearly see that both the sous vide and the reverse seared steaks are cooked more evenly from edge to edge, which is because these steaks spent less time at searing hot temperatures since they were already cooked through. And personally, I think their crusts look better too. At searing temperatures below 500 degrees or so, I've found that reverse searing has a slight advantage over sous vide cooking for a faster searing surface because the surface dries as the steak heats in the oven, while the surface of the sous vide steak is still quite wet. But at really high searing temperatures, the heat vaporizes any remaining water at the surface within seconds. And on a hot charcoal grill, I don't see any difference between the two techniques. And in a blind tasting that I did in another video on sous vide versus reverse searing, I wasn't able to taste a difference either. To summarize, you can sear a great steak at a relatively low temperature around 350 degrees, unless you want some char on the surface, in which case you should use a hotter pan above 400 degrees or switch to a grill. You should cook the steaks using a technique like sous vide or reverse searing first. Reverse searing has a bit of an advantage because it leaves less water at the surface to slow down the sear. But sous vide makes it trivial to cook the steaks to exactly your preferred doneness. But either way, you should sear by flipping frequently, which creates a series of short bursts of heat, followed by a bit of resting that lets steam continue to escape and dry the crust a bit before the next flip. Plus, when pan roasting, each flip moves the steak a bit so that the spots that didn't make good contact with the pan get seared on the next flip. Finally, and this is probably the thing that will change how you sear the most, cool the steaks before searing. Letting the steaks cool for 20 or 30 minutes drops the surface temperature enough that it takes more time before searing can overcook it. You might worry that the steaks will get cold in the center, but they won't. The center can't cool faster than it's heated, and after searing, you'll be pleasantly surprised to find the steak is warm all the way through. This last step of letting your steaks cool can be impractical in a fast-paced professional kitchen, but it can make cooking at home a lot more relaxing. You just let your cooked steaks hang out while you finish preparing the rest of the meal, and then when it's time to eat, give them a brief sear. Following these steps will give you a delicious steak with a great crust and minimal overcooking. But is it the best we can do? No. Let's turn this dial to 11 with math. Stay with me for a moment. This is the heat transfer formula. It describes the speed that heat flows into the crust. The faster the flow, the faster the sear. We've mostly been talking about this part of the equation, delta T, which is the difference in temperature between the surface of the food and whatever is doing the searing. The bigger the difference, the faster heat flows into the crust and the shorter the searing time which means less overcooking beneath the crust. So mathematically, it does make sense to crank up the temperature. At the extreme is the blowtorch. The flame temperature on a propane torch like this is usually a bit hotter than 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. So it'll vaporize water and sear the steak or your fingers almost instantly. This is actually kind of a problem. It's so extreme that you can go from tasty mired flavors to bitter charred carbon almost instantly. You need to move the flame constantly and from a distance so that no spots spend more than a fraction of a second searing. 
it's almost unavoidable that some spots on the surface will catch fire and burn from the intense heat, leaving a telltale torched flavor. Personally, I don't like the flavor you often get from a torched steak. And if you're searing more than a couple of steaks or a big roast, the technique quickly becomes impractical. But if we look below the crust, you can see that there is very little overcooking. And I do like that. What if? What if there was a way we could sear nearly as fast as a blowtorch, but without the risk of burning the crust? If we take a second look at the heat transfer equation, there's another variable, H, that represents the heat transfer coefficient, a measure of how quickly heat is, well, transferred. It's measured in watts per square meter per degree Kelvin, meaning the amount of power flowing across the steak's surface for every degree of temperature difference between the crust and whatever's doing the sear. In an oven, the heat transfer rate from hot air to the meat is around 50. When pan roasting or grilling, it's about 250 to 300. But deep frying, deep frying is special. Its heat transfer rate is around 1,000. That's 20 times more than oven searing and three or four times more than pan roasting or grilling. It's capable of putting a heck of a reverse sear on this tomahawk ribeye steak that I've had resting for about 30 minutes. And because you don't, or at least you shouldn't, heat deep frying oil much above 400 degrees Fahrenheit, you don't risk burning the crust. Not that deep frying doesn't come without some other risks. The handle on this steak is a nice safety feature. Compared to air, oil is a dense liquid that can hold a lot of heat energy. When the steak is added to this hot deep frying oil, the water at the surface flashes to steam and the surface erupts in bubbles. These bubbles do the job of a fan in an oven or air fryer. As they rise, they stir the oil and carry away the relatively cool steam, forcing convection and continuously bringing the hottest oil to the surface of the steak for an insanely fast and insanely delicious sear. You might think this steak will be greasy, but no. Oil and water don't mix, and beneath the crust, the steak is still juicy, so the frying oil doesn't make it past the crust. There's no more oil in this steak than you'd end up with from basting in a pan, and you can see how good this crust looks. Beneath the surface, this steak is cooked beautifully from edge to edge. Mmm, so good. I think I'm gonna have meat sweats later. If you're looking for the ultimate sear, I think that deep frying is hard to beat. Maybe it's not an everyday technique like pan roasting or grilling, but perfection is rarely convenient. What do you think though? What's your favorite way to sear? Are you team pan roast or team char grill? Let me know in the comments below. That's it for today and thank you so much for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit that like button and click subscribe. Subscribers like you help me make videos like this one.